So, the Outlaw King, weapons and armor. Is what we see historically accurate to the time in which it is set? Well, let's find out. Hello number ones, so welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. Now a little disclaimer for those of you who are not yet members of this community. Uh, this video is not an attack on the actual movie. We do realize that what we're talking about, what we're dealing with is entertainment. This is first and foremost constructive criticism because we do understand the amazing potential of setting a movie or a TV series in the Middle Ages and when it's done properly I think uh, it can look a lot better. But secondly, uh, this sort of video reviews uh, is of an educational nature and we want to understand and learn more about medieval warfare equipment. Okay, first and foremost I'd like to say that compared to other TV series such as for example Nightfall on Netflix, uh, The Outlaw King does a much better job at depicting the uh, Middle Ages. However, there are some problems in terms of the clothing but most importantly the armor has some overall geometric inconsistencies there are some shape problems which have to do with the actual functionality of armor and the way armor works that any armorer worth his salt would know now on this video we're mostly going to focus on the things that this film does wrong but this film also does some things right like for example if we look at the great helm this is one of the most iconic helmets of for the middle ages when you think of a knight most people will imagine him wearing this sort of helmet now the majority of video games and films make one fundamental mistake when representing the great helm the uh, shape and size of the ocularia the actual openings for the eyes of the wearer for the wearer to be able to see in originals what we see constantly it's ubiquitous it's always very thin the ocularia are always very thin and not just with a great helm but also with other visored later uh, sort of helmets such as for example the hound scowl or pig faced bassinet again in real historical examples we see the ocularia being very thin and sometimes even protruding forward in order to encourage any blade that tries to uh, get through or enter through the slits to be glanced off. Now in many video games, movies and LARP, low quality LARP replicas of medieval helmets, what we see is that we often see these ocularia being too big and sometimes this happens as well as I have pointed out on the dedicated video on video games that are based on historical accuracy such as Kingdom Come Deliverance where again although the overall shape of the armor looks a lot better and a lot closer to actual real armor they make this fundamental low LARP quality uh, mistake. Ocularia are too big and you can understand how dangerous that could be for a real medieval knight. If a real medieval knight were to see a helmet like that, he would refuse to wear it. So the great helms instead in this film look for the most part good. Sometimes they look silly but other times they look actually very good. The slits are very thin and what we see is that we see mostly a mix of flat top great helms and sugarloaf great helms with more of a rounded surface. Now this is accurate to the period because in the early 14th century is when flat top helmets were starting to be replaced by the more functional sugarloaf which encouraged uh, weapons to glance off or to slide down. Now on this film what we see the main component that we see people wearing is mail. Now that is of course a great thumbs up as my friend Shad at Shadaversity Channel uh, pointed out. Absolutely that's the sort of armor you should see because the film please keep in mind is set it begins in 1303 so we are at the beginning of the 14th century a very important century for the development of armor because it's the transitional period between male armor and plate armor. The beginning of breastplates, the beginning of the actual man clad from toe to head in plate towards of course the end of the 14th century and the beginning of the 15th. Okay so the first problem that we see is that male is not fitted, it's not tailored for the wearer. What I mean by that is that when we look at actual iconography we see that male is very very well fitted to the wearer and we're talking about actual tailoring and tapering um, male arms all the way up to the wrist and in this century you should even extend over but we'll get back to that over the hand so we see the male is very very well fitted but this is not what happens here what we see here is a typical um, low level LARP uh, quality stuff um, mostly mass produced which is baggy uh, sleeves and so you see that there is a lot of male going down here as they move around and that is actually wrong the reason why unfitted, untailored and baggy male is wrong is because it takes actually more rings, more time and it weighs more and it's even less comfortable to wear whereas a proper knight and even men at arms for that matter, in fact even common soldiers if they could afford male they could afford to have it tailored. That's what we see, it's absolute 
adamant, uh, ubiquitous in iconography, depictions, effigies, everything male is very well fitted. And again, at this time, seeing three quarters length male looks very old because that's uh, the sort of Battle of Hastings 1066 kind of technology. By the early 14th century, the male should be shorter. And then again, in this shot here, we can see that it's not short, it's actually longer, super long with a rider split. This, um, they should be wearing surcoats on top, and sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. So again, when you look at this kind of guy, he looks like a late uh, 11th century knight, so it's too. Now, what about the male coifs? And this is the only part probably where I sort of disagree with my good friend Shad. He still made a very good video review, so check it out, link in the description below, and he does mention a lot of very interesting points on the, from the point of view of castles and buildings, and so I do refer you to his video. But this part, he's very happy and excited for the fact that uh, male coifs um, look good because there, are, there is proper padding underneath. But this is absolutely not proper padding, not at all. This is, in fact, it looks rather silly because it's too much overly padded and when I'm saying too overly padded I mean look at this guy's head and compare it to these people's heads. Now you can see that yes the overall shape of the head of a medieval soldier in male in iconography does look slightly bigger than the actual profile of the head but that is because underneath they could have a sort of thin form of, uh, of padding, but most importantly, most of these soldiers are actually wearing a secret helm underneath uh, the male coif. That happens a lot in the art. In, for example, the Morgan Bible has loads of folios that show this, because again, this sort of um, skull cup, uh, can, iron or steel skull cup, you know, very, very low profile, is normally worn either over the male coif or underneath the male coif. In any case, you can see that even with an actual metal helmet worn underneath, the overall shape of the head is still very, very low profile, whereas here it looks like some sort of, I don't know what it looks like to be honest, but it's definitely, definitely, this is not nitpicking, that is not how you wear a male coif. A second aspect of the male coif, which is very important, is what is a male coif designed to do? It's designed to do two things, offer protection for your head, but also at the same time offer protection for your throat. No doubts about it. Now, you don't need to be an, an eagle-eyed eagle -eyed, uh, observer to notice that in this case, just like in, in lots of those uh, video games and lots of representations and lots of LARP events, what we see with coifs is that they are very open and leave the throat exposed. This never, ever, ever happens in medieval iconography, in originals. Instead, what we see is that the male of a male coif reaches at least the chin and it covers, uh, not only it reaches the chin, but then it's not like a floating here, but it actually is retracted and it's very, very well custom made. Now, I'm not saying equipped all, equip all soldiers, although they should be, if they're men at arms, they should all be equipped like this, but I'm saying I understand there are budget reasons, don't equip all soldiers like this, but at least the nobles, the knights, the upper echelon of medieval society, they should definitely have very well tailored mail that protects their throat and protects them properly. But another main problem that we see with the knights during the battle scenes is the fact that the majority of knights do not have any form of hand protection. Now, hand protection, yes, when you look at the um, Battle of Hastings 1066, Norman knight, not much uh, hand protection there, but as we move into the 12th century, um, already um, males start to extend to the wrist, and in the late 12th century, we have the uh, complete cover, the sort of um, integrated mittens of male, and occasionally Occasionally, less um, prominent in art, but occasionally also the individual fingered uh, male gauntlets still, for the most part, integrated to the male hauberk. Now, in the early 14th century, absolutely, they should definitely have uh, the entirety of, of their arm protected, including the hands. Going into battle without protecting your hands is suicidal because the hands are a primary target uh, during combat, medieval combat. If an opponent manages to open a wound into your dominant hand then you won't be able to operate your weapon anymore and therefore you can understand that that means being out of battle so why bothering wearing all the rest of armor yes you won't die possibly it depends but you, you shouldn't die for a, for a wound to your hand unless it gets affected but still you don't want that to happen because then you won't be an effective fighter anymore talking again about male in this film, the English they almost all have male protection for the legs and that is correct why don't the Scots 
have male protection for the legs, they should, as we see in time or in period uh, effigies. Now, before continuing to point out the negative aspects of the things that they did wrong, I'd like to point out a thing that they did very well, and that is shields. In this film, the best things in this film are absolutely the shields, the heater shields that we see, and, I mean, compare them with Nightfall. I, mean, I don't think I need to say anything about this. I mean, look at that. The shields look good. They seem like they're covered in rawhide. Um, the, uh, also, the, the fact that they represent the coat of arms is excellent, because that's exactly what shields do. And uh, another thing is that there is no no uh, rim around the shield because that's again a fantasy thing particularly when talking about heater shields now the shields are very very good um, okay the only thing is uh, to, pertaining to coat of arms I'm not really sure about when we see these black and red coat of arms because as far as I understand that is actually a sort of a beginner's mistake and again I'm not an, an entire entirely normally focused on Scottish and Gaelic um, coat of arms are so normally more um, focused on uh, Europe uh, sort of central Europe European or Italian, German and French coat of arms, but the basic overall concept of colours is you normally have a metal, metallic colour such as yellow for gold and, and white for so silver on top of, an, of a normal colour, red, blue, etc, green. Black and red, mm, as far as I know, is a no-no and the swords and the swords are good uh, they have an overall good shape good geometry good hilts and even better the daggers are fantastic now moving slightly into clothing and then i'll get back to armor because there are still a lot of things i need to say about armor but moving on to the clothing okay um when we see the monks in this film i very much like how they are represented because their clothes is very well taken care of is uh, it looks good it looks ironed it doesn't look uh, ragged like we normally see in in other representations it doesn't look dirty it looks clean and that is very good and for the nobles as well for the most part unless they are in the midst of battle understandable their clothes look very clean as Shad my friend has pointed out but one thing I'd like to say yes some are colorful not enough the still uh, yeah, you do have the occasional blue or green garment but we see no bright colors like yellow like red like bright blue like colors that medieval people loved and we know that they loved wearing wearing colorful garments a lot more than we do still in this film we do have the occasional colored uh, garment but for the most part we still see the main colors of, of of the majority of the shots in the film are gray brown black now the modern day in the modern day we have a very different understanding and approach to colors and in fact um, uh, you know I sell my own merchandise and I know for a fact that the majority of the t-shirts that I sell are either black or white and that is actually corroborated by a lot of um, studies that I've done myself on, on this like at the moment in the United States the most sold color for t-shirts and clothing is black uh, are black and white however in medieval times no gray brown these are not pro prominent uh, predominant colors but i do understand that often filmmakers do that because everything looks gray everything look, looks dark and yes we are in great britain so i understand it's rainy and muddy but we should also see them enjoying the occasional uh, beautiful weather singing together dancing together like medieval people people did and they took proud proud in their garments they also took care of them in fact modern day people People, we are spoiled okay if we have this little statue here of the goddess Athena if it gets a little cracked I just throw it away and replace it but this is not how things were uh, done by medieval people even the rich because when you had something produced for you it was most of the time good quality and, and because you didn't have the sort of cheap modern mentality of mass producing everything and then we you know we we just throw away everything they didn't throw away they repaired they fixed so uh, again it, as I say it's doing a better job than other sort of of, I mean some of the swordsmen that we see they look very good they look like medieval swordsmen but there is still a lot to do when we look at the English knights uh, there are that that's when things start to become really problematic because if we look at these two guys first of all the half cannons of plate that they are wearing they look like they're from Skyrim the plate spaulders that we see late 14th century in 1303 no absolutely not too futuristic also, if you, if you allow me a little nitpick, it, it should be further up, okay, it's a little too low, the way it's worn. But most importantly, the most wrong thing that we see in this image, in this picture, is the condition of the male shirt of this knight. Now, 
if this is immediately after, after a battle, immediately after a clash of knights in combat, then sure, absolutely. But it has to be immediately after, because a knight would have spent a huge amount of money on the production of his mail, and the moment mail got destroyed or these sort of holes, it was broken like that, it would be repaired immediately. Okay, so a knight who goes around with broken mail like this, for example, that's definitely not a rider slit. So it's not, it's just, it's broken. And it makes no sense, particularly if you belong to the knightly class. If you are a nobleman, absolutely not. Now, the horse protection um, or the barding, I'm not going to spend too much um, time on this because I'm preparing a dedicated video to that, but just suffice to say that, yes, it existed, of course, and horses were protected. However, uh, what we see in this film looks 16th century-ish to me. So, um, again, I'm going to say no. Now, as Shad said, the fact that the pauldrons or the spaulders, sorry, the spaulders worn by the Prince of Wales, uh, the fact that they look gold, Possible, we don't know. So um, it, the, the, the real problem there is not the fact that they have rivets, isn't because they could be washers. It's not the fact that it's gold. It's the fact that I don't think they should be there, considering the time period. Male, that's what he should be wearing. Also, another thing that I'd like to say um, is going to pay his taxes uh, to the King of England, and he put the money or the contents of this inside a box. Medieval boxes. Have you ever seen medieval boxes? They are amazing works of art. This is, does not look like a medieval box if you have seen medieval boxes. They should be painted, richly coloured, very well. Boxes were very artistic in nature in, in medieval times. Also, this room, and this is actually something I'd like to add to what um, Shad said, it should be white. It should be painted white, possibly even, even castles, depending on the castle, but it should be painted white uh, from the inside and even decorated, very richly decorated, and that is something that was done beautifully well, exquisite representations of the inside of some uh, medieval buildings in the video game Kingdom Come Deliverance. They've done an excellent job with the buildings in that video game. Now, what about the gambesons? Yes, I'm happy as well. I'm very happy that there are gambesons in this film. And uh, normally, you don't, you know, which are basically padded uh, clothing. We could say padded armor, uh, sometimes used underneath plate armor or mail. Uh, other times, used as a standalone protective garment. In which case, of course, it would be thicker. Um, the only thing is that if it's for infantry, shouldn't have a rider split. So this guy is clearly, I think, he's an infantry man. He shouldn't have a rider slip split. And also for this guy, I know he's a little mad. So I'm not in, in within the the actual lore of the uh, the actual story but he, he should close it medieval hose they are very wrong uh, very wrong um let's not just focus on the shirts uh, on the on the tunics let's focus on the hose and the actual sort of trousers of the times if you will uh, they were very 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 much tailored these look like modern trousers uh, it's, uh, and the shoes also i have seen in the film shoes with actual heels heels in medieval times no 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 and occasionally they look like they are just wearing modern shield uh, modern shoes and just wrapped with some sort of leather so i don't particularly like how the shoes are represented here but apart from that was it was it a good film yes did i enjoy watching it absolutely um so the film is doing it it's, it's a very good thing because we see a filmmaker who is trying to get a better representation of, of armor and clothing and the Middle Ages in general. But as you could see, there were a lot of things that are still wrong. So, um, and for some reasons, I mean, I do understand that they have limited budget, but there are some mistakes, for example, not in this film, but for example, the big ocularia, that's just, you know, it doesn't cost much to make it thinner. It's just a matter of getting a person who knows how to do it and not someone who's just repeating the same mistake because you've seen another armor do it, we've seen another armor do it, maybe. I mean, they have spent money on riveted mail and that is an excellent thing. So I think they should go the extra mile and get it tailored at least for the protagonist, or at least for the king, for the prince, and for the few Scots, uh, Scottish nobles, they should have it tailored. Um, again, from a medieval perspective, everyone should have, it, should have it tailored, but we can understand there might be problems, uh, we can even excuse them, maybe some of the mail was taken from, looted from the ground, and maybe they're wearing it anyways because they didn't, couldn't afford something else, maybe if they were rebels, okay, but at least the upper echelon of warrior society absolutely get the mail uh, tailored. 
Okay, well, I think I have talked enough. Uh, as you see, I had a lot of things to say. Of course, big hello to my friend Shad from Shad Aversity Channel. He did mention me on this video, saying that perhaps I would have had something else to say, or something more to say about the armor in the film, and yes, yes, I did. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you find it entertaining and educational in a way. And uh, of course, remember, if you're not yet a member of the community of the sword and you're not a member of my channel, uh, please subscribe, become a noble one for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.